So welcome everybody from my side. I'm very glad that we have Tim Lichtenberg today with us. I know Tim as an extremely productive scientist and I'm very happy that uh, he's here with us to share his research. And uh, I, to briefly introduce Tim Lichtenberg, Tim is a research fellow at the moment at the Department of Atmospheric, Oceanic and Planetary Physics at the University of Oxford in the UK. His research links astrophysics, solar system science and earth science. And um, his research is currently funded through a fellowship by the Simons Collaboration on the Origins of Life, as well as a early postdoc mobility fellowship by the Swiss National Science Foundation. Before he came to Oxford, he completed his PhD at the university, at the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And yeah, for his undergrads, he studied physics in Göttingen. Yes, and with, with, these, uh, with this short introduction, Tim, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Carol, for this uh, very nice introduction. Um, and thank you everyone um, and the seminar organizers definitely uh, also to give me the chance to speak here. Uh, it kind of feels a little bit like uh, coming home, of course. Um, we had like a few years back, uh, uh, I very fondly remember all the interactions we had, you know, with all these uh, inter Zurich and inter, inter Switzerland, um, uh, like all the planet uh, planet related discussions. And to be honest, really, the the the, the publication or the, the this the publication that I talked uh, today about is really uh, was originally born in uh, during interactions we had at, uh, at at the University of Zurich. Um, and at Planet Z and Planet S meetings. And uh, I really want to highlight, of course, the, the contributions of two people, uh, Joanna Dronczkowska and Tom Hans. Um, so Tom is still, current, is still currently working at University of Zurich, of course, and I think he's in the audience, so he can correct me when I say something, I misinterpret his, his, his work uh, uh, for, that, uh, for that project. And uh, uh, the uh, simulations of the disks that I will talk about, port planetary disks, really rest on, on the work of Joanna, um, who was for a few years, of course, uh, until I think two years ago or so, um, postdoc at ICS as well. Right, um, so what I will do during uh, the talk is I will, um, in the beginning for just for giving an introduction, what is the, what is the whole point of this paper and what kind of questions we, uh, we're trying, we were trying to answer or a little bit to elucidate um, is, so I will kind of, uh, zoom out um, and, and just look at kind of what else is there um, before I really go into some of the details of solar system exploration, formation of the solar system and um, chronology and clustering in the meteoritic record. And I will, if, if there's the time, uh, if I can make it, uh, then uh, I'll zoom out again and, and try to interpret our, our work a bit in the context of other planetary systems. So uh, as, as we discussed in the beginning, uh, if you have a question, maybe just interrupt me during the talk. And if not, then I'll try to answer questions in the chat or something after, after the talk. Okay, so, um, right, let us start with the solar system at the very beginning. Um, of course, um, most of you are from an astrophysical, astronomical background. So this is nothing new, but I think it's it's always worth remembering, and specifically in the context of this research, it's worth pointing out the slightly peculiar structure of our solar system, right? So we have these four terrestrial planets on the inside, and they're mostly dry, and terrestrial, rocky. Um, and then we have uh, separation, the asteroid belt, which may be debris from the planet formation process itself, um, but it can also be uh, interpreted in different ways. And um, we have on the outside, we have the more massive ice and gas giant planets um, with a substantially different composition than the inner terrestrial planets. And um, now, of course, before the exoplanet um, revolution 25 years ago or so, this was the only planetary system that we knew. And really all, all major theories, all our whole understanding of planet formation rested on that picture. Um, was kind of, you know, like we, we, we thought this, this is the way you need to, you build a solar system or planetary system. Um, 
But by now, of course, we know this is not necessarily the case. Uh, we, we start seeing all these different um, planetary systems and we know that there are, there is some, there are some random factors involved. Um, physics and chemistry of planet formation do not necessarily have to play out like in the solar system originally. Um, that really uh, back to the question or ask this, this brings us to the question, what are these physical and chemical effects that enabled like the habitable world on which we inhabit today. Now, to, to just to demonstrate a bit further, really um, the, the problem, the magnitude of the problem, um, this is a slightly outdated by now, but it really underscores the point I wanna make, Mars radius diagram of exoplanets. So you see Mars in Earth masses on the x-axis and you see um, radius of a given exoplanet on the y-axis in Earth radii. The Earth is down here. And um, the different dots uh, scale with the equilibrium temperature of a given planet, including the uncertainties on the mass and radius. And um, so if you are in this diagram, if you're somewhere here, then your planet is mostly composed of um, gas, you know, hydrogen, helium. Um, if you are somewhere down here, then you, the elements uh, in your planet are heavier, for instance, like iron or, or rock. Um, but if you are somewhere there, then it's just at least uh, hypothetically or theoretically conceivable that your planet is composed um, to some substantial part of actually of lighter elements like water, for instance. And we know these types of planetary bodies exist. Um, Ganymede is the, let's say the archetype of such a, how I will call them water world. In the solar system, we have some sort of ice, rocky, rocky, perhaps iron core interior, which is overlain by an ice mantle. Um, and uh, potentially like an ocean as well. The structure of this type of body is very different from the earth. And um, to illustrate this, the question really becomes here, um, what is the mixture? What is the elemental composition? What is the potentially the chronology that you need to build an earth-like planet? Um, and um, so, so how far you know, can you go from this, from this compositional mixture that, and that we know makes up the terrestrial solar system, like solar system terrestrial planets. Um, the issue is really, really crucial and it's not that easy. So if you compare an Earth-like world, an icy world, the Earth has about 0.1% of water, which enables kind of a liquid water layer on top, very tiny in comparison to the total radius. Now, if you just add one weight percent into, the, into an Earth-like planet, then um, the structure you get is very different from that. And you, because of the equation of state of water, um, if you expel all that water on the surface, then the, uh, at the bottom of this global ocean, you will start to form high pressure ice phases. This means that the interior and the atmosphere of these types of planets are completely uh, or nearly completely sealed off from each other. Um, and this means there can be no uh, interior atmosphere connection like on Earth that enables the long-term um, climate uh, thermostat on our world. Now, um, we start to get evidence from extrasolar planetary system systems here, like, uh, like this paper recently on the TRAPPIST-1 system with lots of contributions from, from the University of Zurich in Switzerland as well. We see the inferred water mass fraction for a fixed iron mass fraction of the planets. Uh, for the period of the of the Trappist one planets here, with different assumptions, and for the let's say most Earth-like conditions in iron mass fraction, these planets also in principle are tend toward being ice worlds. So we don't know what they really look like, but if we assume Earth-like elemental abundances of these planets, then the most they are most consistent also with these types of ice worlds. Now. The whole question of how you form a planet really plays also into how you create life in the in the very first place. So this is illustrated on the right hand side here, uh, showing kind of when we go back in time on our own planet, shows the end of bio biological signatures in the geochemical uh, record in a sense, and at about four billion years. When it starts, you know, when 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 we now stand understanding of what makes a habitable planet, the astrophysical uh, constraints come into play and really define our 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 notion when the Earth kind of transitioned from an uninhabitable, um, you know, lava planet 
um, with lots of impacts and lots of bombardment to an actually a world with a hydros hydrosphere that enabled um, the origin of life. Now, um, this, this story really starts, and this is the, one of the points I want to make, the story really starts during the formation. And these planets, planets just in general, but also specifically terrestrial planets, they're not just born and then start to evolve. They evolve while they are born. And I won't go into all these details here, but this is really one of the key points I want you to take away from this presentation, that during the formation, and this is a kind of like a chronology of a of a, of a plant uh, for growing uh, growing uh, terrestrial planet, different geophysical mechanisms that kind of take that play into the evolution of this planet from the planetesimal stage during the evolution or during the formation and uh, creation phase in the planet during the protoplanetary disk phase. Um, now the this 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 connection this this um, this evolution of the protoplanet. Uh, from the accretion phase to the long-term evolution phase really connects the, our understanding of what makes a habitable planet, what makes the Earth originally habitable in the first place to the exoplanets. Because most of these constraints actually are really not, we, there may be fundamental limits to what we can achieve in our own world because 4.5 billion years of tectonic activity have, have basically erased lots of this evidence. But exoplanets give us the chance to study this diversity of planets in, in a large number of systems. And so with increasing, um, with increasing um, uh, data from exoplanet systems, we may be able to get some insights on our own world. Now let us come back to uh, the uh, to the solar system now. And I said I will zoom into the solar system formation. This is what I'm doing, going to do now. So there are specifically for the solar. Um, what I'm what I, what is important from with regards to constraints and the formation of our uh, on our model that I will explain here are two things. So we have recently, in really just the last few years, let's say three to four to five years. We got a lot of new constraints that um, we need to work into our understanding of our planetary systems form. One of them is that the plant accretion process itself is fragmented. What does this mean? So we see here complementary evidence from the from exoplanetary systems and from the solar system. The left hand side shows mass in solids in protoplanetary disks or in exoplanetary cores, for which we have some understanding of the planetary mass. So what you see here is the mass in solids, and this is this is measured in millimeter sized dust grains from the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in the class zero, class one, and class two disk phase. So this is kind of an evolutionary sequence. You see that it goes down with time. Specifically, it goes down to below total integrated masses um, below the planetary systems that we observe, meaning that the planetary systems must start accreting before the onset of the class two phase. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to explain the mass we see in exoplanetary systems. We have similar evidence actually for an early onset of planet formation, a really early onset of planet formation together with this protostar from the solar system. This is shown here on the right-hand side. This is time after CAIs, which are calcium aluminum rich inclusions, the oldest known solids that we know that are specifically in cosmo and geochemistry typically taken as time zero of solar system formation. And what you see is the timing, timing of iron core formation in planetesimals. And that requires, core formation requires um, a heat source in order to reduce friction in planetesimals so that the metals and the silicates can separate from each other. This means that these planetesimals from which these iron meteorites derive originally from must have been formed also earlier, again, in the class zero or class one phase, potentially contemporaneously to calcium aluminum bridge inclusions. But this is not the only thing that we know about the um, chronology of planet formation. Uh, from the solar system specifically, we also know that the onset of, so we know that the onset of terrestrial planet formation was early in the inner solar system, as illustrated by these ages here. But we also know that it was protracted, so it didn't just start quickly and then finished quickly, but it took quite some time. And this is derived also from cosmogeochemical constraints here from specifically the hafnium tungsten uranium lead dating systems, which, which tell us 
that the mass of the proto earth specifically took at least it took at least about 100 million years for the earth to finally assemble we have similar evidence from mars that also speaks of an early onset but for the size of mars mars some kind of a protracted finish of the accretion process latest papers put this put the finish, uh, put the, uh, let's say the cessation of accretion for Mars on the order of 15 million years. Um, in addition to this temporal information, we have spatial information. Now again, from disks and exoplanetary systems, and we have spatial information from the solar system. On the left-hand side, you see these uh, by now well-known uh, rings and uh, structures in the dust component and protoplanetary disks here uh, in, in, a, in a ring system. And we are still debating what is the origin of these of these rings, of course. Now, on the right hand side, we see comparable and complementary evidence uh, um, from the solar system. In the chromium 54 versus titanium 50 isotope space. So this is in stable, uh, stable isotopes that uh, originate from a, from specific nucleosynthesis events in, uh, for instance, supernova environments and what we see is that if you take measurements from individual planetary bodies and meteorites in the solar system, then we see that these, these meteorites cluster in two different classes, the non-carbon naches NC and the carbon naches reservoir CC, which is typically thought of as dividing the inner and the outer solar system in, this, uh, in the area, uh, the inner and the outer solar system during the early, early, early onset of accretion and uh, during the protoplanetary disk stage. Now, the question here becomes, of course, if we have some sort of um, some observation in isotope space, how does this relate actually to the composition information we have additionally? Again, that the Earth is actually rather dry and has only a minuscule amount of water in its interior versus outer planetary bodies, for instance, like Europa or Titan, seem to, inha inherit, seem to have inherited a large amount of water and other, other volatile elements. Now, the general picture and the general idea of this, of course, uh, I would say historically already, is the idea of the frost or snow line, which kind of during the stage, during the postplanetary disk stage, separated a, let's say, a dry part uh, with accreting rocky planetesimals and a water rich part with accreting rock ice planetesimals. You can imagine them as kind of comets or cometesimals. So, then dynamically, the idea has been for a long time and still is partly that uh, once you formed like a proto Jupiter or Jupiter itself, then you have the separation between dry planetesimals, color here scales with water mass fraction and log units. Uh, you have a separate, uh, like a kind of a transition region and a water rich region uh, beyond about two to three AU. And then the, the dynamical interactions with Jupiter during growth lead to scattering of ice-rich or water-rich planetesimals and kind of pollute the inner planetary system with this water, which eventually is, suppo is supposed to explain the water content that we observe today in the terrestrial planets. But let us summarize this a bit because it becomes important that we have this structured in a way. So the inner solar system is volatile poor and has an NC-like isotope signature. It has a rapid start in accretion, but takes kind of prolonged time about 100 million years to finish accretion. And the total mass in solids actually in the inner solar system are dominated by Venus and Earth, about two Earth masses in solids. In comparison, the outer solar system is actually rich in volatiles, has a CC-like isotope signature, and may it maybe con is consistent with a later, later start actually. But there has been suggestions actually to suggest that the outer solar system in fact Created earlier, so we will have, we will look at this. In addition, uh, there's a much more mass in the outer solar system, tens of Earth masses in solids actually, mostly dominated by the core of Jupiter. Okay, now the point is, planet formation really is a long journey, right? And the following, that's why there's another picture. The following slides are from Joanna. Um, now there are the the grains in the disk actually start from micrometer sized grains that fall onto the disk and then grow to make a planet. Now, the point is uh, that, of course, there are multiple, let's say, um, problems along the way. And this, I guess in the last 10 to 15 years or so, really, the, uh, at least in the European planet formation community, there has been a large um, 
emphasis on actually overcoming several of these growth barriers. A uh, few of them are the bouncing barrier, where the gra where grains, when they coagulate, actually at a certain size regime, depending on these conditions, cannot stop, cannot grow and coagulate anymore. The reason is that they are too large, and they instead of growing further, they bounce from each other and stop growing, or they fragment if the um, accumulation velocities are too high. Another one is the radial drift barrier. So the point is the, the particles, uh, while orbiting the protostar, they um, orbit slightly faster than the gas because, because the gas is pressure supported. That means they feel the, the particles feel aerodynamic drag from the surrounding gas, which makes them lose angular momentum. They spiral towards the portal star and um, in principle vanish or get accreted by the portal star on the order of a few tens of thousands of years, which is much, much faster than the accretion time scale. Now, uh, the one of the at least one of the leading content, uh, one of the leading ideas to to circumvent these problems is streaming instability, um, which um, solves the issue of these growth barriers at about a centimeter scale by jumping directly from millimeter-sized grains to meter size, uh, to kilometer-sized asteroid-like objects. On the right-hand side here is a video of this process. Um, so you see what you see here is kind of the surface density in solids. Um, and you see the clumping of the material into larger asteroid-sized objects. Now the issue, <clears throat> sorry, the issue is the streaming instability requires elevated solid densities. So this doesn't typically work with standard, let's say, 1% dust to gas, uh, standard dust to gas ratio, but it requires higher values than that in typical simulations. So the reason, uh, the, 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 the question here really becomes, it's not anymore how you grow really from slowly from millimeter size to kilometer sized objects. The question really becomes, how do you create over densities in the disk to trigger planetesimal formation? Now, um, before I go into this, um, here's a picture, a qualitative issue, uh, picture of the disk. And so this is, uh, again, the, um, the, div the divisive region between the, um, uh, the interior and the exterior of the water snow line. So interior of the snow line, um, water is in vapor phase. And outside of this uh, snow line, the idea is really that water is in solid ice phase. That means the solid density is enhanced relative to the interior part. Now, that means um, grains here oh, that also Grains also on the uh, are typically thought and given from 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 laboratory experiments. Grains are um, thought to stick better, and that means they can grow faster to larger sizes based on the snow line because of the two effects of sticking and enhanced sticking and uh, enhanced solid density. That also means though that they drift faster. So grains generally uh, accumulate and coagulate beyond the snow line and then drift very quickly. But when they encounter, when they stream past the snow line, they sublimate, the ice content sublimates, and the drift velocity decreases. Um, and this actually leads to sort of traffic jam effect or a pileup of dust material at the location of the snow line. And this eventually can trigger the streaming instability and lead um, to the formation of planetesimals at the snow line. Now this works on the order of 10 to the five years. And I, uh, uh, yeah, Ali Bear, this is supposed to mean, of course, um, I encourage you to read Joanna's uh, Dronchkovsk and Ali Bear 2017 or Dronchkovsk and Dilma 2018 on that specifically. Now, there's an additional effect, and this is important. The difference between these two effects here is important for the structure and the timing of the chronology that I'll explain in a few slides. Now, there's an additional effect, the cold finger effect, that works a bit differently, that is operating at the, on, at the location of the snow line. This works by uh, water vapor uh, diffusion from the inside of the snow line to the outside and recondensation onto icy grains just beyond the snow line. This locally, again, enhances the solid surface density of dust grains and triggers the streaming instability. The fun part here, so the interesting part is, this effect is actually faster than this pileup or traffic jam effect that I explained on the slide before, but it's less effective. So let us summarize. The cold finger effect is faster, less effective, works on a time scale of a few thousand years, can trigger planetesimal formation. Similarly, the traffic jam effect is slower, but more effective. On and works slower on a time scale of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 years. 
Now, what we are going to do is now we are exploring uh, whether the solar system can form an integrated picture of um, dust coagulation, planetesimal formation, and then accretion and internal evolution. And for that, uh, uh, Joanna explore, uh, ex ex um, kind of used the, uh, the old shoe uh, infall model, inside out rotating infall model, originally developed in the 70s and then um, um, employed for some of these, some, some calculations in the, in the 2000s. The idea here is that the solar system itself kind of forms from a rotating molecular cloud. The disk is built from the inside out. So you kind of start accreting and material kind of falls into the disk and builds the disk from the inside out. The combined effects that I just explained are shown here in this video. Now, um, this is the uh, accretion stage of the disk itself. So the in what, what I will call infall stage or class one stage. And the disk stage is the class two stage where the disk is basically fully built and just evolves viscously. Now this is orbital radius, this is surface density, and this is time. And the color scale that you will see here is the formation rate of planetesimals. So the, this, this, this line is the snow line evolution during uh, the combined evolution of the disk. And the accumulating effects of this cold finger effect that I explained before, the traffic jam effect, can lead to the formation of two stages of planetesimals depending on disk conditions. One, which forms early, but with not a lot of mass, and the second one with much more mass in outer parts and different parts of the disk. So there are two distinct stages of planetesimal formation because of the com combined effect of snow line movement during the infall and class two disk stage and planetesimal formation during those two episodes. Now you will see this mostly from now on in this kind of configuration where I color code reservoir one and reservoir two in two different parts. Now coming back actually to this isotope, these isotope constraints that we have from meteoritic studies. And here helpfully color coded, of course, in red and blue. Now remember the uh, in, in isotope space, in longer and stable isotope space, the inner and outer solar system are kind of separated or cluster in two different, two different groups. Our uh, this this model here also produces structure that is kind of um, that clusters in two different reservoirs that differ in their formation and accretion look time, and also therefore the amount of material that these, these planetesimals incorporated from different parts of the disk. So why is this here a headache in general, right? So I explained to you that a pebble in general, when it starts growing in the disk, will feel headwind and it will kind of stream toward the protostar. Now this mechanism in general is a problem for this type of for this type of observation, because dust, dra dust grain drift should, in principle, homogenize the entire dust reservoir of the disk on the time scale of a few ten thousands or maybe hundred thousand years. But it doesn't. It didn't. We see this structure. We can still tell apart individual bodies today. Now, Sal, no, no. We asked the question in this simulation: um, Is there a mechanism that actually keeps the disk separated? and that can reproduce the observations that we observe today. And in order to quantify this, we kind of quantify the so-called pebble flux, which is the amount of mass that streams past a given orbit at two, which, is, which, we, which we take as being representative of the inner solar system here, and 15 AU, representative of the outer solar system or reservoir two here. This is what you see over here. So this is time after CAI formation. This is the pebble flux and Earth masses per millions of years. Red is this red color. Uh, this red line here is, is the pebble flux at 2 AU. And the blue line is the pebble flux at 15 AU. And what you see is that initially, during while the disk is still uh, accreting until about 700,000 years in this simulation, the pebble flux is, uh, reaches comparable magnitudes, but then it starts to strongly deviate by, by up to two orders of magnitudes toward the end phases of the disk. And the reason here is simply that actually a pebble that accretes from large, starts out at large orbital distances will never make it into the inner solar system because it is stopped due to the traffic jam effect that leads to a large accumulation on a uh, large formation uh, of planetesimals beyond the snow line, which moves in time. Now, um, 
to summarize this, just let me just qualitatively summarize what this means here. The idea here is that I told you that this, this clustering comes from at least two different nucleosynthesis events. And the idea here is that the infall event itself changed composition over time. So we start building our disk with an enriched infall where the initial material that builds up the disk is enriched. But then at some point during the infall, the composition of infall, the material that builds up the solar system changes and, and changes to a depleted composition, uh, like it, which is isotopically depleted in supernova-derived isotopes. Now, while this is happening, the disk is set, ex itself expands viscously. And after that is the case, the, the, the grains start uh, coagulating and drifting inwards. But the, the blue ones here, the enriched grains, are kind of stopped due to the traffic jam with the snow line. And therefore, when the disk eventually cessates, um, when the disk stops being there, the disk, st the disk st stops living in a sense, um, uh, it keeps the memory of this original infall, uh, this original transition in infall. Now, there's an additional information uh, in here uh, that relates to the accretion mechanism itself, actually. So recently, not recently, but in the last 10 years or so, there has been a debate about the actual, the, the, how, how planets accrete. Um, and the two end member cases here are planetesimal accretion, which is, let's say, the, in a sense, the older idea, but really it's not. Actually, this one is the older idea. But so let's, this one, after, after the Apollo missions, the planetesimal accretion scenario really has set in. And the last was the dominating accretion scenario in the 50, six, last 50, 60 years, in a sense. The idea here is that you start out with planetesimals, they collide with each other, forming larger and larger embryos, and eventually planets. Now, the pebble accretion, accretion idea works differently. It works, you have already the idea is that you already have a protoplanet or an embryo of a given mass. And you start accreting dust grains directly from the disk. And so there's a different dependency here. The planetesimal accretion time scale actually um, is really sensitive to the geometrical cross section of colliding bodies, whereas the uh, efficiency in the pebble accretion mechanism is really dependent on the mass of the protoplanet, therefore, the gravitational influence of the growing protoplanet itself. So we quantify this in the simulation here. This is what you see over here. So time after CAI formation, again, this is growth time scale, which is the inverse of the accretion efficiency. And so the question uh, we asked here in this specific plot is, if you imagine in an initial planetesimal population that is formed from the streaming instability, how fast can the largest objects in this population grow from other planetesimals or pebbles? And again, quantified at 2 and 15 AU. So let's focus for specifically here on the red lines. The solid line is pebble, pebble accretion for 300 radii planetesimals. That is approximately the upper size that is formed from the streaming instability and the same for planetesimals. What you see here is that initially, specifically in the early stage and during the infault stage, the growth time scale from pebbles is much higher than the ones from planetesimals, which means that in the simulation or in the scenario, the growth, initial growth is dominated by collisional accretion from planetesimals. But then there's a transition and accretion regime, which suggests that once the disk transitions to the class two disk stage, the growth mode actually switches from planetesimal accretion to pebble accretion, but it switches again. And the reason here is the buildup of reservoir two which again prevents pebbles from the outer solar system reaching the inner solar system. And therefore, after about a million years or so of disk evolution, class two disk evolution, the inner solar system becomes strongly pebble depleted. And this suggests that the inner protoplanets cannot accrete further, therefore kind of stall in their grow. And from then on, rely on collision and accretion again, which is rather slow at this stage. Now, um, we, this is not really for an astrophysical audience, but I want to mention it specifically here because we had to explain in this scenario, you know, like the initial planetesimals kind of accrete beyond uh, about two, three, five to seven AU or something like this. But this is exactly the right, um, the right orbital distance for growing protoplanets to reach the terrestrial planet, today terrestrial planet orbits uh, due to type one migration. This is here calculated 
uh, for fixed planetary sizes, assuming a number of accretion um, efficiencies here from these simulations, and then fixing the size and then asking the question, uh, a portrait planet that starts here of a given mass, which kind of orbit would it reach until the end of the disk? And so uh, this shows that this region here where we believe in the scenario, the terrestrial planets to start accreting um, is approximately the right, uh, the right orbital distance so that the final planets, the portal planets that are still not completely finished in their accretion reach terrestrial planet orbits um, of when the disk kind of finishes. Now let me summarize this again up to this point. Um, so the idea here of the accretion scenario is really that you have initially this disk spreading, there are no planetesimals, then you start forming the inner planetary system via icy planetesimals. This is important here. So the planetesimals all form ice ridge, all form beyond the, so the snow line. And then the inner terrestrial portal planets accrete via collisions. Um, then eventually the planets will migrate while they undergo pebble accretion, but a limited amount of time only. The outer solar system accretes later, but because of the higher surface density of the outer solar system, actually this state, these, these um, secular stages of collisional accretion and pebble accretion can proceed much faster compared to the inner solar system. Now there's one problem that you may have spotted already, um, relating back to what I explained originally. Why is the Earth dry if every pl all planetesimals um, form beyond the snow line? Uh, and the answer here is that the portal planets, while they accrete, evolve internally as well. This is top typically not taken into consideration in planet formation models, but we want to make the point here that these geophysical and astronomical models really need to be taken both into account and be, let's say, let, um, they need to, need to be synchronized relative to each other. And uh, we need to explore what it means um, that the portal planets probably evolve compositionally while they accrete. Now, what does this mean, um, this aluminum dominated stage here? Um, the point is that from cosmochemical measurements, we can back calculate the amount of initial radionuclide content of the solar system. And the energy output from radioactive decay, there's energy output from radioactive decay. This can actually heat material that is close to the decay. And this is shown over here. So you see time after solar system formation again in millions of years, and you see radiogenic heating in silicate material, silicate material of, planet has, of planetary material. Now, um, this is the time, approximate time of planetesimal formation in the solar system, as, as we know from meteoritic dating. And this is the total heating from radionuclide, uh, radio, radioactive heating. So the long-lived ones, these two here, for instance, still power the internal geodynamic evolution of the Earth today. But in the first few million years, really, the energy output from radioactive isotopes was completely dominated by aluminum-26. And this is so energetic, in fact, that it heated planetesimals that formed during the first two million years of the solar system or so to the extent of silicate melting and degassing of primordial volatile content. And we can make uh, simulations, computer simulations of this. Uh, this is based on, uh, on a simulation code that is developed at ETH. Um, what you see is kind of the internal evolution of silicate materials um, of these planetesimals where color scales with temperature and also silicate density. And these planetesimals really imagine them as kind of miniature lava worlds that are floating in space and colliding with each other. And what we, what we did here for this, for this work is basically to quantify the thermal and composition influence of this process during the accretion process. And what you see is planetesimal radius, again, for the approximate size, let's say, interval that is produced by the streaming instability versus formation time in CA, after CA ice uh, in millions of years. Color scales for highest mean temperature integrated over the volume of these planetesimals. And this is after five millions of years of evolution. What is important here is that these different regimes have different, very, very different orders of magnitude, different evolution in, 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 uh, or effects on the volatile and compositional structural content of these planetesimals. So we were specifically interested in two things. First is water rock interactions or hydrothermal activity. The idea here is that you have an initial water ice rock content of these planetesimals. Because it gets so hot, in fact, the water starts melting and degassing from the planetesimals. And when it's hot enough, there's literally nothing left. 
in the re remaining planetesimal is dry. The second interesting effect is core formation. So the idea is that the initial planetesimal accretes homogeneously. And so you have like kind of silicates and tiny, tiny uh, iron nuggets uh, sitting there homogeneously. But when you heat, um, then the iron actually segregates and forms an iron core overlain by a silicate mantle. There are two, two principal effects how this can work just mechanically. One is percolation, and this works via um, melting of troilite phases, FES, um, which can interconnect and form an interconnected network um, that kind of percolates downward and forms a core. And the, but it's kind of debated in the community if this mechanism actually works or how e efficient, effective it is overall. Um, I, I will take about a few more minutes, but then I'm done just for just as a as a comment. Um, but the effect that is really definitely working is so-called rainout in internal magma oceans. So when planetesimals heat substantially, the entire rock content melts. And you kind of have lava there. At this point remaining uh, iron droplets rain out onto the core. This literally works like precipitation in the Earth's atmosphere. So like water rain in the Earth and the Earth's atmosphere rains onto the surface. Uh, just here, the ambient medium is liquid magma and the rain and the precipitation is actually iron. Okay, so why does it, is it relevant for this scenario? Because uh, these two planetesimal reservoirs have substantially different formation times and therefore initial content of aluminum 26. The inner solar system receives high internal processing, the outer solar system very low internal processing. And we can kind of simulate this, we, we simulate this in, in, in this scenario and try to match it or, or, or checked. Basically the hypothesis was can we, or the question was, can we match the chronology of the meteoritic record with this? And what this is what you see over here. So this time after see ice and mega, mega years again, and this is the fraction of the birth planetesimal population, ether reservoir one or reservoir two, for these two uh, scenarios that I explained, percolation or rain out. The different color, uh, different line styles here, are the, the, the dashed line style is total, meaning which fraction of the integrated population experiences core formation from ether percolation or rainout. And the solid line with the shaded background here is the change. This is basically the moment differentiation happens for a given mechanism in the population. And this is for reservoir one and this is for reservoir two. And you see that reservoir one forms cores just statistically earlier, uh, whereas reservoir two also forms cores, but but less integrated because the materials get less heated and there's a total more material. And what you, so reservoir one forms uh, its cores about here, reservoir four, two forms them about here. And this is the chronology we have from the meteoritic record. So this is metal silicate segregation times from iron meteorites from the hafnium tungsten dating system, in the non-carbon ashes reservoir and in the carbon ashes reservoir. So inner and outer solar system. What you see is that the within the uncertainties, our simulation reproduces the timing that we observe in the NC and the CC reservoir. This is for core formation and now uh, for water rock reactions. So um, again, um, uh, this is the same axis, time after CEI formation, fraction of final planetesimal population. Um, we were interested is specifically here in, in this. This is what is plotted hydrous rock to decomposition. So we're asking the question, you know, uh, how long does it take for the material to fully dehydrate these planetesimals because the earth is dry, right? So reservoir one experienced a peak of um, hydrothermal activity really here. This is, this is what you see over here. There's large amounts of water reacting with rock, but then the temperatures become so high that all hydrous remaining phyllosilicates or hydrated silicates actually decompose again, and the remaining material is very dry. Now, reservoir two, in fact, um, has a later onset of hydrothermal activity, but you, what you see is that it doesn't go down anymore. There's no dehydration uh, like this happening. This is what is what we also see in the meteoritic record. This is plotted here as so-called aqueous alteration times in meteorites for the non-carbon ashes reservoir and the carbon ashes reservoir. There's only one measurement so far of ordinary chondrites at kind of large uncertainties. 
So um, there's not really anything to um, um, to match here. The point is really um, we we would expect, and in this simulation, this is the onset that we can measure because um, these 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 measurements here they they date kind of the material that is formed, the formation mechanism of hydrated silicates, and so. Um, we, any any memory of this of, of this of this peak here gets lost during the dehydration process, but uh, the simulations so so this explains why the Earth is dry even though it forms from an ice rich planetesimal reservoir. And additionally, this peak here in hydrothermal water rock reactions, specifically the slope of this peak, explains the um, the clustering of aqueous alteration times in the CC record. And, and this is, uh, I explained this already. So this is a summary that you can see in the paper. And because I think time is precious, I will skip over some of the, some of the last slides and just summarize um, actually what I said. Let me find the last slide. So this is here. So the point of this, of this model really is uh, to try to um, present, present a combined scenario, a physical forward model that suggests explanation for the meteoritic chronology that we observe in the in and outer solar system. And what it does specifically is suggests that this, the terrestrial inner solar system planets formed by a heterogeneous accretion uh, mode and a heterogeneous time scale. So basically the idea is that the initial planetesimal population that formed accreted via collisions and there was an intermediate but brief phase of pebble accretion that eventually, because outer solar system pebbles couldn't reach the inner solar system anymore, then finished its accretion via collisions, which takes some time and can explain why uh, actually we, we see in hafnium tungsten dating, in the hafnium tungsten dating record, we see that the Earth accreted uh, only like prolonged over a prolonged time scale. And then finally, um, the dichotomy that we see in composition and isotope space in the solar system in this scenario is explained by the spatially and temporally distinct planetesimal bursts, and specifically the water or the dryness of the inner planets by the geophysical evolution that is driven by radiogenic heating during accretion, which leads to an accretion sequence that is kind of starts with water depleted material and goes over to dry and then eventually to water rich. And with that, I want to finish. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Tim. This was a great talk. Um, I open the room for questions. And if you want to raise a question, please raise your hands um, with the reaction button or uh, put your question in the chat. And I see already some questions from Dan Bauer. Dan. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Hey, great. Yeah. Very, uh, very good to see you pulling together all these different elements. So I had sort of a bit of a low ball question, but at the same time, uh, what is the role for Jupiter? Um, is, do you somehow constrain, for example, the maximum orbital migration of Jupiter because you basically can't have it sort of disrupt this? Or for example, does the traffic jam, could that form Jupiter and you know Jupiter never moves inside the ice line um, because otherwise you're going to kind of mess up the, the dichotomy that you're trying to build? Yeah, um, so the main part uh, I, I i personally think this is interpretation really of the scenario is that it kind of reopens again the formation mechanism of jupiter so there have been papers recently that were su that suggested that explained actually the isotope that you know what i'm talking about the that they that, that, that try to explain the isotope dichotomy with the formation early formation of jupiter in fact um which kind of necessitates that you form jupiter within the first million years after cai formation um, and I think this, this model in principle has some physical problems that make it hard to create a Jupiter Mars planet until that time, then keep it at that orbital location. And, um, and what this, our model here does, it kind of presents an alternative mechanism to initiate the isotope dichotomy in the solar system. It doesn't mean that Jupiter doesn't accrete, of course it accreted. And I think uh, what, what we do here, let me, shortly find actually just one of those let me actually um this is a good plot probably so the idea here is that this the whole space of this reservoir too would present uh, a reasonable starting location for jupiter and what it does like honestly it would kind of disrupt uh this specifically the end part 
of of what we do here because there's no there's no interaction in our in the, in the simulation between growing potentially gap opening planets um uh, and 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 the the let's say the accretion of this planetesimal reservoir, uh, we surely have to follow this up dynamically. So I think it kind of what it does specifically is it reopens the question: what, when is the onset of Jupiter's accretion? It kind of gives accretion models again more time to finish Jupiter's accretion. Really, just you know, like that it that it accretes until the end of the disk, and that's it. And doesn't have to do have, doesn't have to be ten Earth masses or twenty Earth masses already at one one mega yeah cool thanks there's a question i think lucio you were next yeah yeah so actually my question was a bit similar i i was wondering about jupiter again uh, from the point of view of the model that uh, you know we developed actually Jan mostly developed you, you you're certainly familiar with the paper you know the combined pebble and planetesimal accretion model for jupiter and in that one actually it, the main thing is that there is first a a pebble phase of rapid accretion, and then the planetesimal accretion phase kicks in at around one million year and slows down the growth of Jupiter. And so, in that model, we basically need that you know the in the outer solar system there is a second phase dominated by planetesimal accretion, at least for Jupiter. I was wondering if that would be you know in disagreement with your general picture because I understood that in your general picture the outer solar system. Uh, undergoes a pebble accretion phase after one million year, or, 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 or maybe I, did, I, I didn't catch it correctly. Uh, so, so what I, what I, I basically only in, in I, I only basically discussed uh, the in a in a in a in a, in a, in a planetary right. system. To be honest, um, I have I like I, I I said it I said this also in the in burn uh, burn uh, discussion that we had recently. I yeah. specifically have nothing against uh, there's nothing against this um, against your uh, the, the the Ali Bear paper from 2018. Um, I think the point is really that the specific growth stages in the, in the paper are derived um, kind of following this um, uh, the the these time scales here, right? These time scales here specifically from the 2017 paper. Um, and I think uh, if, if specifically this time scale here is not, doesn't have to be like this, then I think the specifically the first two, one to three mega years maybe cannot directly taken out of, of the, out of the Ali Bear paper anymore in a sense. So I wouldn't have, I don't have anything against this. And I think it's very realistic that there's some, some growth transition also for Jupiter, but I'm really not an expert in, in gas giant growth. And so I think uh, we deliberately left um, left that out also because there's there was a lot of on our plate already. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's interesting to think of, maybe one can, can you know, compare the, the, the two different pieces of, of the, so the inner solar system predictions that you make with with the other ones and see whether they can be put together. It would be interesting. I really hope that someone will do this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, I agree with you. There is another question from Paolo Sossi. Uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, Tim, uh, great, great talk uh, as always. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask about your prescribed um, inner outer solar system dichotomy. Do you sort of quantitatively tackle the question of volatile budgets or do you just say, this is meant to be more volatile depleted than the outer is, has more volatiles than the inner. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, we don't. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, we, uh, so these thre thresholds that employ in the, in the planetesimal simulations are really, you know, like are, are really qualitative in your, in your sense of the word. <laughs> uh, we don't, we, we, what we, what we do literally is so I track, you know, what is the, from from experimental from experiments basically we have like temperature thresholds for dehydration of like amphibole amphibole amphibolites um, and other silicate silicate phases, and we basically make the assumption you know when these thresholds are crossed, or breached, then we assume the planetesimal interior at this given subvolume to be dehydrated. It doesn't go beyond this. Uh, the question is really in a sense you know like this was to answer the question if you know, the snow line may be uh, like the prime location, orbital region to trigger planetesimal formation. If it moves and multiple planetesimal populations can form, but all planetesimals originally accrete beyond the snow line, 
how do we explain water poor in our solar system? And that kind of inverts the question that is typically asked. You know, typically people ask the question, I create dry and then I need to need to deliver volatiles. Mm -hmm. Here it's inverted. We already have volatiles, but we need to get rid of them. And I think we need to much more deeply look into what this means for um, volatile de-volatilization, you know, and maybe in synchronization with laboratory experiments in that problem. Absolutely. No, it's just an interesting observation that some of the CCs, like the CV chondrides, are actually more volatile depleted than mm -hmm. with the NCs, which, such as the anthocyte chondrides. So yeah. just uh, yeah, I'm not sure how these how these these, these pieces fit, fit together, but it's an interesting, uh, interesting problem. There's another question from Jason Hu. Oh. Hello, oh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, hello, team. Uh, I'm Jason. I'm, I'm a postdoc uh, from UCH working on also planet formation, but I, but I mainly focus on the latest stage of planet formation uh, after planetesimal is formed. And uh, so uh, thanks for your very nice talk. Uh, I really enjoy it very much. Um, you mentioned about the heterogeneous mode of accretion of planets in which we, we start from uh, planetesimal collision and then goes to PEPO and then go back to collision. So I'm wondering in the PEPO phase, where you, um, my interpretation is that you still have uh, outer solar system material driven inward to the inner solar system. So would that um, still homogenize this? I try to, so you, so you said that our model would predict that some outer solar system material makes it to the inner solar system. So it's a little bit important what specifically you mean with this. Yeah, about the paper equation you mentioned here is- um, Oh, yes. Paper still originate from the outer solar system or, or it's actually within the ice line. So, so you still have the two reservoirs separate with each other. Yeah. You mean you mean kind of that that some pebbles here and this this part make it kind of in the, into the inner part. Is this what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, it actually. Um. I agree. Yes. Uh. So what you when you when we come when you compare the specifically the pebble flux here with this, what you find is that the so the pebbles this this phase of additional pebble influx into the inner solar system, pebble-aided growth, how we call it here, right, right. is actually because of this time gap here. Yeah, so the, the reservoir one starts, stops, stops secreting at some point, but yeah. before reservoir two really starts secreting, pebbles can still make it. Now, there are two things. So first is that it's unclear, uh, the orbital, kind of the orbital distribution of the isotope carriers in the um in this in this transition of two two compositions of infall it's not clear when this happens and what is the initial orbital you know separation so you can imagine for instance that the nc signature kind of is distributed just initially like while the disk is secreting you know between 1 and 30 au or something like this and everything beyond is more CC or CAI or dust um, average solar system CI uh, composition dominated. Um, it depends on this and there's no quantification in our model of this. So I cannot answer the question really if there's too much mixing, um, okay. but it actually, there's an interesting, there has been a paper also that claims, you know, that in calcium signatures that people claim to have claimed to see some sort of signature of pebble accretion. So what I believe is that a, an additional phase of pebble accretion is very well and consistent with the observations from isotope studies. So I think the inner solar system can, let's say, um, bear a, a, an amount of pebble accretion, but a limited amount. It cannot, I don't think it can be agreed to 100% from pebbles, but I think um, the signatures are consistent with some, some fraction of pebble accretion like we like we have here it can actually help to explain some of these signatures like the calcium calcium signal we see. Okay. Yeah, There's okay. another you. question by Emmeline Bono. Uh, hi Tim, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, I have two questions actually. The, the first one is um, 
um, how can we differentiate between a model uh, like yours and you know any other explanation for the, for instance the fact that Earth has so so little water, like you know the fact that Jupiter might have blocked the influx of uh, icy planetesimals or, or or such. It, I mean, do you? Does your model explain more of the observations that, uh, than this kind of, of uh, other models or how? Just plainly to say, I think it is the first one that at all ever um, provides a forward model explanation for the chronology of clustering of the iron meteorite record. Um, so um, yes, I think it does make a number of predictions that can distinguish it from other models. Another one, for instance, relates actually to the isotope signature in the um, in the reservoir two uh, that we observe here, which kind of you know would be be the onset or would would build the outer solar system record. What we would maybe partly would be the inner Kuiper belt today. Uh, so we predict like a transition in DH signals in this outer reservoir. Um, yeah, there are a number of things that we can say uh, specifically about the. Uh, let's say the chronology and orbital split here. Um, and I think, so it's hard to be compared, to be honest, because none of the other models has offered actually any, 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 any very explicit predictions like this. Because um, if you try to explain specific signatures with one, um, with one feature, let's say, uh, you know, a gap in the disk, that is induced by proto Jupiter, then you always have some ambiguity on when to do this and what else is going on. So um, I think there are a number of features and we are very explicit, especially in the discussion of the paper about this. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I think we have to work on this. That's really awesome. And uh, the uh, second question, uh, will quick. Uh, so I guess this mechanism is quite uh, generic. It's not uh, solar system specific. So can you can you use it to uh, maybe infer you know what we could expect to be the the composi uh, composition of the Trappist one planets for instance, like could you say that okay uh, with our model we would expect like uh, these uh, I don't know the two inner planets to be to be of the reservoir one uh, uh, kind of uh, composition but the outer ones would be like more reservoir two. Yes. So for TRAPPIST-1, the case is a bit different. We wrote a paper about this uh, now two, two, two years ago, uh, exactly. Uh, so the, uh, like, I didn't have time to go into this really, but one of the things, so the, one of the points this, 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 this makes is actually that planetesimal or volatile content is not only a function of orbital distance, but formation time of planetesimals. Uh, and, and this is, this is the kind of degeneracy that this introduces additionally, initial enrichment levels of a planetary system in radioactive, uh, short-lived radioactive isotopes. And we don't know this. Not every system has the same amount of aluminum-26 because it depends on the stellar, um, the star formation environment. So we can only actually, for this type of thing, we can only make statistical predictions. What is the, what is the point? Generally, I believe, and I, uh, I think we, we kind of articulated this in this paper in 2019, but I'm also working on another one that makes this for carbon phases at the moment, is that in general, this heating by short-lived radioisotopes should in principle um, decrease uh, the, the spread in volatile content of the planetary system. And I believe we see this in the TRAPPIST-1 system, where if you account for uh, greenhouse uh, effects for TRAPPIST-1, uh, I think B and C it is, um, the actual the volatile content is not very, um, is, it's not flat, but it's kind of on, on one level in a sense. And so the amount of aluminum-26 in a given planetary system, if you increase it actually, changes the bulk water mass fraction of the planetary system as a whole. Uh, this is at least what we have argued two years ago. And um, I think this is very consistent with our uh, the, the new simulations that we've done there. You know, like they are com more complicated for sure because you need to be very explicit. We have a lot of information on the solar system, whereas we don't uh, for other planetary systems. So yeah, I think you can. I think it's very hard to say something explicit for one single system because of the you know, stochasticity of a specific system in general. But I think the, um, 
what is interesting to be is when we get more information on small exoplanets, really far below, you know, the um, the photoevaporation gap. Um, what is is there a difference between kind of these Earth-like worlds and these water worlds? And I think this model kind of predicts that the distribution of Earth-like worlds with water worlds should scale with the distribution of short-lived radioisotopes across planetary systems. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answered your question. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, we have, uh, I think there was another question um, left, but just to say we are already over time. So for those people who want to leave, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, Lucho, you still have your hands raised. Do you still have a question? Yes, I mean, I, I had more than one, but you know, it depends on time and, and whether other people want to jump in, uh, in in place of me. If not, I, I can actually ask another one. Yeah, okay, because there, yeah. like, there was also Hai Yang, maybe. Yeah, exactly, I saw. Uh, but you, you de raised your hand. Oh, uh, yes, indeed, because my question is quite uh, 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 similar to Emily's question. Okay. Uh, um, uh, but if, yeah, uh, you've given me a chance that I would maybe uh, further clarify with Tim. So um, you, okay. I'm, I'm very fascinated by the geophysical evolution contributed by the heating from Element 26. So my understanding um, was that uh, um, element 26 should be distributed quite uh, so roughly, um, uh, uh, I mean, the, in the um, in a solar system disk in this scenario, even um, between the outer or, or, or the inner. Um, that's based on, let's see, the observations like the aluminum uh, normalized, for example, by magnesium or silicon. These are quite a refractory elements. So uh, they show quite a consistent between like the chondrites and uh, our inner rocky body material. Uh, so that irked me to me that uh, if the radiogenic heating from 26 can contribute so much to, um, the, um, to, the, to the volatile depletion in the inner disk material, but it could also do the same thing to the outer um, disk material. Uh, but actually that's not what we observed between, um, um, as we observed by comparing the Carbonist chondrites and uh, uh, and uh, inner rocky material, uh, but I must have missed something here. So Tim, yeah, but uh, if you can clarify something, that'd be great. Uh, the difference is just formation time, because the um, because the um, the the half life time of aluminum is seven hundred thousand years. Aluminum twenty six, not the stable long lived aluminum actually, but uh, the 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 radioactive aluminum twenty six. Um, decays to magnesium 26. And so the half-life is 700,000 years. And so the energy output really only is important for a very short amount of time. Um, for the devolatilization, about 2 million years. For core formation, maybe 1.4, like two half-lives or something like this. So um, it, it, it really, for this effect, it really requires early planetesimal formation and a specific minimum initial aluminum 26 content in the in the planetary system. And I think we have a lot of evidence by now for this process for the solar system, but also for other planetary systems. Um, so I think that you need to take into account both the radial distribution and, and the formation you know, sequence of the planetary system. Um, I'm not sure, I, does the, the, is this, what, does this answer your question? I'm. I'm not, uh, we, we had this yeah. discussion several times. Doesn't matter. I, I know, I mean, I don't know, like I, yeah. this, uh, yeah. I would like to go to uh, Lucho for a f yes. final question because we are uh, so yes. much over time. Yes. Yeah. I, I'll try to be quick. And I was, I was interested in um, understanding a bit more what is the role of the disc itself? You know, the, you mentioned the viscous spreading of the disc in the, in the you know, chronology of events that uh, mix differently the, the reservoirs and is, is that, I mean, I guess you do something in the model to take that into account. I mean, how do you actually do that? Or, or is it just, you know, qualitative? You mean the, how the disk itself 
yes, contributes like, because to what? Is, contributes to what? Can you specify? Well, the disc is, is, as you mentioned, you know, there will be a visco spreading of the disc, so the disc will yeah. change size. No, no, that is taken into account. That is like that is from Joanna's disc and dust coagulation model. So it's really this. Um, it's really the Huizo and Juyo 2005 model. It's like you kind of specify an alpha con alpha value. Uh, it takes into account infall rate, so is, which is kind of defined by the angular momentum of the initial cloud material, which is just defined. You define it, okay. um, and then and then you you have a physical grid, and then you you in it we we quantify the amount of gas, dust, okay. and pebbles in in each of those grid cells in a sense. Uh, so it's not this is not qualitative; it's quantitative. But and and in in the, in the appendix of the paper, we give all of that gas, gas distribution, solid distribution, change in time. Yeah, so okay. so it's quantitative. Okay. Even though, of course, it's a one D, it's yeah. not a fluid dynamical model; it's a parameterized alpha disk model. Yeah. But it's a, it's at least quantified. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. I. I hope we we could at least uh, have in, some time to answer uh, some questions. But yeah, I see there there would be lots lots more. But uh, there's no time to do this. Uh, feel free to um, contact Tim. Um, and with this, I'm I thank you very much for this seminar. And um, yes, it was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.